It's rabbit season! Multiversus is back! We're finally seeing the full launch of Player First Games 2v2 focused platform fighter and all-star corporate crossover from the studio that helped bring you Pokemon, The Avengers, and Malcolm X. Technically, bro, it's Super Smash Bros meets Warner Bros, and oh brother am I excited. Between the technical test and the beta, I already put over 200 hours into this game, and even though on the surface it might seem like a product of corporate cynicism, once you get into the weeds, there's something magical about it. The big name IPs of a draw, sure, but beyond having the Joker or the funny meme Shaggy, Multiversus tries to bring some genuine innovation into the platform fighter genre thanks to its doubles focus, its free-to-play model, or its layered perk system. But it also has some of the most ambitious, unhinged, gonzo, over-the-top moveset designs in platform fighter history, and I am here for it. Let's talk about some of them. Let's start off with the bucked to face of Warner Brothers himself, Bugs Bunny. Bugs was my main in the betas, and for a good chunk of them, he was a top tier. What a coincidence. But that's not why I mained him, I just think he's neat. Do I need to justify why I like Bugs Bunny? He's not Lola. He's a cool and funny guy, aside from the times he was racist. Still, I think now is a good point to mention that I won't really be focusing on game balance in this video, especially as it's so subject to change in a live service game like this, and I'll try to focus more on the moveset design and concepts that Player First Games seems to be using. But yeah, early on Bugs in Multiverses proved to be an overwhelmingly strong character, and I think that's because the conceptual execution does the character so much justice. In his cartoons, Bugs Bunny is a confident, wisecracking trickster, someone whose zany antics infuriate and humiliate anyone foolish enough to mess with him. Bugs Bunny is the kind of guy who will trick you into digging your own grave. If you upset the bunny, that means war. Expect him to unleash all kinds of goofs and gags and tricks and tools to get the upper hand on you, all over the course of a couple of minutes. Which brings us back to Multiverses. This Looney Tunes ass character is an absolute agent of mayhem who can dominate the stage with an arsenal of giant and deadly props. Take for instance, his rocket. Bugs can create absurdly large missiles and launch them across the stage with wild abandon as he channels his inner North Korea. These rockets are massive, lethal and lingering, especially if they fly up, in which case they can cause even more havoc as a hazard on their return journey moments later. Similarly, Bugs Bunny can summon a big metal safe which becomes an enormous, hard to ignore hazard that can be pinballed around the stage. Combine these moves with Bugs Bunny's signature tunnel ability, a move which creates two rabbit holes that can not only teleport Bugs and his teammate, but can express deliver projectiles like the rocket and safe while altering their trajectory, and you have the recipe for some wacky situations. Hitting someone with a returning rocket or launching them into the stratosphere by teleporting a safe into them is perfect cartoony violence. These moves aren't just setup moves, they're setup and punchline moves. It's perfect comedy is baked into his moveset. This is all possible because Multiversus has fully embraced MOBA or Overwatch style cooldowns, which allows for movesets to have some disproportionately disruptive moves in a far more expansive way than we see in something like Smash Bros, which only dips its toes into the idea of cooldown mechanics. It also means that Multiversus characters have an innately fluctuating gameplay tempo, depending on how many of their options are online, so match flow can be a bit more dynamic as characters gain and lose the tricks up their sleeves and Bugs Bunny is the most extreme example of this. But that's not all, folks! Bugs Bunny has even more shenanigans, including dynamite, cream pies, Mr. Meeseeks, and sexual assault. Or, if you're more of a fan of traditional slapstick, Bugs is happy to scrap with fisticuffs, or pulling a hammer out of hammer space, or even slapping his foes around with a baseball bat like the righteous New Yorker that he is. It all adds up to an infuriating, zany, funny, confident, and capable trickster. Bugs Bunny in Multiversus is loony and cartoony. He feels like a stinker, a wascally wabbit, a little chungus. And above all, he feels like George Washington Bunny. And that's just one character. So, if Bugs Bunny is the dev team's attempt at translating a slapstick cartoon icon into a platform fighter, Tom and Jerry is the exact same feat, but exponentially harder because they needed to make it work as a two-in-one fighter. By now, it's well known that the premise of Tom and Jerry in Multiversus is that the two of them are trying to fight each other at the same time as they fight you. In fact, if anything, you're just getting caught in the crossfire, but that doesn't make it any less impressive. So, Tom might shoot Jerry from a slingshot, or try to bash him with a hammer, or they'll have an impromptu tennis match with deadly volleys. As a concept, it's brilliant, and the animation and technical execution backs it up. 
even more impressive is that this all works in a playstyle that can unironically be called cat and mouse. Good Tom and Jerry players weave between a mid-long range game and close quarter bruising, and whether or not Jerry is alive or with Tom or separated from Tom changes whether or not the fighter prefers to be more evasive or can afford to be more of an aggressive predator. One funny side effect of this ambitious design is that Tom and Jerry, the cartoon cat and mouse duo made for children in the 40s, have attracted a shockingly hardcore and terrifyingly competent player base. This is partly because their game plan isn't immediately obvious, and their mechanics are somewhat nuanced, so they have a relatively high skill floor which alienates newcomers. But I suspect it's also partly because they're the main of Multiversus Evo Champion Void, whose dedicated fan base is like an army of competitive copycats. And copy mice. So, the internet decided it would be funny if the silly, scared stoner man from Scooby-Doo was one of the most powerful beings in fiction. And now look where we are. Shaggy Rogers can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Batman, has Ultra Instinct superpowers, and is a master of karate in a game with the official Scooby-Doo license. Because of a years-old internet meme, we now have a fighting game where Shaggy is the baseline character. Where Shaggy is the brawling bruiser who fits the same role as Ryu in Street Fighter or Mario in Smash. Kung Fu meme Shaggy is the heart and soul of multiverses. And every day it seems like we get closer and closer to him facing off against Big Chungus. I'm torn on whether or not I like this, so Shaggy's actual moveset is pretty straightforward. He kicks, punches, and has a gimmick where he can charge his mysterious powers to do super-powered versions of his basic special moves. Kind of like Cloud Strife's Limit Charge in Smash meets Popeye's Spinach, except wielded by a man who gets his powers from a different green source to either of them. I kind of wish the Limit Charge worked differently because it feels like the game design is sending a mixed message where Shaggy seems like he wants to run in and be aggressive, but he also has a huge incentive to run away instead of applying relentless pressure. Personally, I'd much prefer a character like this to be pure rushdown. Still, I can't deny that Shaggy's moves flow well, and I really like how he settles into the game as both a casual menace who can get away with spamming a braindead fly kick, and a surprisingly deep combo monster with some nasty kill confirms at higher level play. That stuff all works fine, but I think once he starts kneeing people, that's when I have a problem. One of Shaggy's moves in Multiversus is a knee attack with the same pose as Captain Falcon's forward air in Smash Bros. It's a funny move for Shaggy to have and a cute tip of the cap from one platform fighter to another, but Shaggy's knee isn't Captain Falcon's knee. Falcon's knee, the knee of justice, is famous for its deadly combo finishing sweet spot. And even if Falcon's knee isn't really as cool or hard to land as it might first seem, it's still a strong, flashy, exciting move on an aggressive, showboating character, and is beloved because of it. It's a nice punctuation mark for Captain Falcon to have on a character of his archetype. Shaggy's knee, on the other hand, is a much more ordinary move. It's a good move, but there's nothing flashy about landing it. No exciting sweet spot, just Shaggy posing like a man that he isn't. Which is why my favourite parts of Shaggy's design are the parts where he's not a meme, not a Super Saiyan, not Captain Falcon, but he's actually able to feel like Shaggy. The parts where the silly Scooby-Doo character is able to peek past the Ultra Instinct shell. I love his neutral air where he skedaddles in place, complete with the sound effect, or how he throws a big sandwich at people, or how Matthew Lillard brings so much life to all aspects of the character with Multiversus's many voice barks. But I guess we wouldn't have any of that if it wasn't for Ultra Instinct Shaggy being the reason that Shaggy is here to begin with. So hey, bring on the memes. I can't wait for Pickle Rick to fight King Kong's Harambe skin. Alright. Back to Looney Tunes. Hailing from Van Diemen's land, the Tasmanian Devil is a force of nature, famous for his gargled speech and devastating tornado attacks. And, I gotta be honest, his multiversus design fascinates me. You see, I've been known to very occasionally make very cringy Smash Bros moveset concepts, including one for Crash Bandicoot. In that video, I tried to work out how to design an insane marsupial who's 
potential platform fighter kit was deliberately over-centralized around an iconic spin move. And lo and behold, thanks to Multiversus, I get to see a professional team tackle that exact same design exercise. And the results have been interesting. During the early access release of Multiversus, the Tasmanian Devil's Tornado was an absolute menace, a far-travelling, deadly, huge, spammable vortex that would tear through Taz's enemies. And it felt beautiful. Like, the Tasmanian Devil is a devastating cyclone in his source material, so the devs were just being faithful to that. Plus, Taz is a violent idiot, so he should get huge reward from the most mindless point forward and hit buttons playstyle. The character's essence was perfect. But the tornado was too strong. It was tricky to deal with for seasoned players, and downright oppressive against players new to platform fighters. The design was perfect for Taz, but it was too toxic for multiverses. The devs realised this was a problem and hit Taz with an emergency nerf for the open beta's launch, which made his player base more extinct than the Tasmanian Tiger. And now Player First Games finds themselves at a fascinating crossroads. How will Taz be buffed and changed over Multiverses' lifespan so that the soul of a mindless tornado monster can remain, but the outcome is a healthy fighting game character? How will the devs incentivize a natural playstyle that uses Taz's entire arsenal of gorgeously animated combo brawling moves, while also doing justice to the tornado. I don't know, but I'm excited to find out. Speaking of characters who are incredibly powerful in their source material, but have to be toned down for a platform fighter, let's talk about the Man of Tomorrow. Canonically, Superman is faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, and able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Also, he can fly and shoot lasers out of his eyes, which I think is more notable, but what do I know? How do you put that pile of overpowered gibberish in a fighting game? And how do you work around it while still making Superman feel... like Super... Man? Well, you could do what Injustice did and make him spam full screen lasers. That, um, certainly looks powerful. Doesn't look fun, but it looks powerful. Or maybe you could do what Superman 64 did and, um, y yeah, don't do that. There has to be another way. In Multiversus, Superman's invulnerability is implied by him being a super armored, super heavyweight, an archetype that innately feels powerful, but is also much more mechanically reasonable than asking Jake the Dog to need kryptonite to stand a chance. But what about his flight? Well, instead of giving him completely free movement, he has a big telegraphed and not particularly agile gliding command grab which uses Superman's flight, but also has clear limits and is reined in by multiverses limiting the amount of special moves you can do before touching the ground. He's also unique in being able to dodge upwards from the ground, which is a nice boon that makes the character stand out and showcases his flight in a more subtle way. What about his power? Superman's super strength. Well, most of his moves have some kill power behind them, so Superman always feels strong, and the devs also made the frankly inspired decision to give him two command grabs that can delete his opponents if done near the blast zone. They're amazing. His up special is my favourite move in any platform fighter. It's an aerial command grab that allows him to toss his opponent in any direction. These moves are cheesy as hell, but they're also very funny, and absolutely fulfil the fantasy of being this ridiculous farm boy alien. Plus, while they're definitely good moves, they're not game-breakingly unbalanced due to being pretty telegraphed and requiring Superman to put himself at risk to use them. Overall, his strength is kept in check with relatively sluggish frame data, which might seem odd for a man with super speed, but I think it works. It's worth noting that the feeling of speed is still evoked in his kit by some rapid-fire punch attacks and a big teleporting punch mechanically reasonable moves that are flavorfully representative of super speed. Sonic the Hedgehog should take notes. What about Superman's eye lasers? The superpower that caused Injustice Superman to be a bit too ridiculous. Zona Superman wasn't fun for anyone. Well, in Multiversus, instead of Superman's lasers melting opponents with a death beam, he shoots the ground with his lasers, which causes an explosion. The explosion, not the lasers, is the hazardous hitbox, and an explosion is a much more reasonable danger for opponents to avoid than a full-on laser beam would be in a 2D game. But it's not as though the lasers don't feel powerful. 
Peck, the game literally portrays him as being powerful enough to make the ground explode. So yeah, the fantasy is fulfilled, but it's a reasonable ranged move for a platform fighter. So yeah, Superman in Multiversus feels like a super-powered demigod. All of his main powers are represented, but it's done in such a way that it's perfectly reasonable for him to fight Velma Dinkley, and for that to feel like a fair fight. I also really like how Multiversus dealt with Wonder Woman. Simply put, the wielder of the Lasso of Truth is, appropriately, the most honest character in the game, at least on paper. She was good enough to win Evo, so either Nakat is a wizard or Wonder Woman is a little bit dishonest. Her lingering armor buff is undeniably strong. Still, Player First Games chose to make Wonder Woman their straightforward sword fighter, and she's a very good candidate for that. While she could have had her tiara toss or a cheesy recovery with her invisible jet, Wonder Woman's weapon prowess is a major part of her character, as is her integrity. So why not make her an honest, baseline, fundamentals-based sword fighter? She's a great candidate to be this game's Lucina, although. I low-key hope that Banana Guard does it better. I think it's interesting to compare Wonder Woman to Multiversus's other sword fighters. Finn the Human is similarly simple in his design, but he's not a highly disciplined fighter, as much as he is a dude looking to have fun fighting, so instead of him being extra phenomenal at rewarding fundamentals, Finn can kind of get away with holding forward and mashing mindlessly. It's an easygoing playstyle for an easygoing hero. Meanwhile, Arya Stark is a refined duelist and cutthroat assassin. She has a pretty high skill floor and has some fairly precise combo trees that require huge amounts of character knowledge and dedication to get the most out of, at least in theory. Patches in the beta oscillated a bit, making her difficulty and risk reward vary a bit. Still, Unlike Wonder Woman, where general platform fighter fundies goes a long way, Arya Stark requires specific character mastery and familiarity. In turn, this means that while Wonder Woman feels strong as soon as you launch the game, which is appropriate for a god-created superhero, Arya players have to go on a training arc and go from fledgling, struggling little girls to inhumanly lethal forces of nature. Actually achieving this effect is a knife's edge tightrope act of game balance, but if player first games can pull it off, Aya players will go through the exact same arc as Aya does in the show. It's brilliant. Also she can have Batman turn into a pie and then have LeBron James eat it, which is kind of fucked up. Why is she in a children's game? LeBron James, a real human being who has a beating heart and goes to the bathroom and who will someday die, is in this game. It's awesome! It's incredibly silly that he's here to begin with, it's goofy that the game's only real human is voiced by a different person, and it's funny that, as far as I know, LeBron James has never publicly acknowledged Multiversus, but just because it's absurd doesn't mean the designers phoned it in. In the platform fighter genre, it's incredibly difficult to have a projectile-based fighter who actively wants to scrap up close. Usually if a character has strong ranged options, incredibly passive play will be optimal, and then they'll only want to box when they're forced to. LeBron James throws basketballs. Fun fact. These balls can then rebound from his opponents and allow LeBron to collect them, throw them all over again. Furthermore, if he doesn't have a new ball, he can wait for a lengthy cooldown, or he can simply hit his opponents up close to get a new ball. So, balling leads to more oppressive offense, and scrapping leads to better balling. He can ball to close in, grab that ball, or hit to get a new ball, Ball to finish combos, ball to control stage, balls to the fucking wall. LeBron James knows how to use a basketball. Integrating LeBron's close quarters options with his basketball makes both aspects of his kit richer and more potent on top of being incredibly fun and flashy. I love LeBron James. It's the weirdest parasocial relationship I've ever had. Selfie time. Hashtag winners. But that's not to say the execution is perfect. Even with the delightful synergies baked into his ranged and close quarters options, mitigating risk is still optimal, so LeBron still benefits a lot from playing more passively. As pointed out by Smash commentator Kony, LeBron in Multiversus can be one of the best stock tanks in the game by simply running away, staying alive, lobbing balls, and forcing his opponents to chase him down while his teammate scraps. So, the coward's approach is a viable playstyle, meaning that he's not the perfect version of a projectile-based brawler, but it's definitely a valiant attempt, and when he's on the attack, 
his kit oozes style. Multiversus will definitely be good for LeBron's legacy. Except for the part where Velma Dinkley could call the cops on him, so they had to patch out the police car because the optics were so bad. You can tell a lot about someone based on their OC. For instance, this is a character that I made. Doesn't it feel like you've now seen inside my soul? He sees inside your soul. Rain Dog is part reindeer, part dog, and part mold, judging by the sickly green coloration, and is the only original character in Multiversus's star-studded roster. And for some reason, the devs decided that the blank slate original character, who could be anything, would be... A zoner who runs away and spams projectiles. At least he's cute. I'm mostly kidding, but I do think Raindog is fascinating. Because Raindog isn't weighed down by expectations or source material, he gives us a uniquely pure insight into what kind of game the developers want multiverses to be. Simply put, Raindog is made from the ground up to have cool ideas for a 2v2 platform fighter game. So, we have moves like Raindog's Laser Tether, a beam of light which Raindog can attach to an ally that damages any enemies who are caught in its stream. The damage is great, and is a good incentive for Raindog to use the move, but what really makes this move magnificent, in terms of team synergy, is the fact that Raindog can use the Tether to recall his ally to Raindog's position. Suddenly we have a tool that can do great damage, dictate stage positioning, or even save someone from certain death. Or what about Raindog's aerial up special, in which he curls into a ball? This move lets Raindog's allies pick him up as an item and throw him like a Twitch streamer's cat. Not only is this funny, but the Raindog ball is surprisingly effective with proper coordination. These kinds of moves allow for some wacky strategies and dynamic gameplay, and it's great to see Multiversus make the most of its 2v2 heart and soul. However, I do have one other problem with this freakish chimera. Some of Raindog's most powerful moves are chargeable projectiles, and I don't think they're very well telegraphed. Isolated, they look fine. Raindog breathes in and coils back and his weird floating heart glows. It's good animation work, but as soon as the camera pulls out and there's a fight happening, it's quiet and subtle, which is a problem when it can kill you from across the stage in a very chaotic game. Silent but deadly might be good for farts in an elevator, but it's not good for a platform fighter move. To use a random example as a comparison, let's look at Super Smash Bros. That series has lots of strong, chargeable projectile attacks, but unlike Rain Dog's attacks, an attack like Samus's Charge Shot has an enormous, high contrast, glowing, crackling particle effect and makes a loud electric charging sound the entire time. Samus's Charge Shot is usually very obvious to her opponents, even when she's on the opposite side of the stage. I think Rain Dog's projectile attacks need to be extremely loud and extremely obnoxious, like your neighbor's dog barking at 3am, except in this case, the dog burns down your house. Ridley is too big, they said. A character that big could never work in a platform fighter. And boy did Nintendo prove those people wrong as Ridley proudly joined the Smash Bros Ultimate roster. Only he was shrunk down and hunched over. And a lot of his moves had him awkwardly not stretching out as far as he probably could. And some of his signature moves didn't even make the cut. But Ridley was here, just like everyone wanted, right? Smash Bros took a conservative approach when it came to adding a giant to its roster. And in the end, that character didn't break the game, and wasn't too degenerate, and was pretty fun, but also didn't make that big of a splash. But Player First Games wanted giants to be giants, and they wanted a splash. How could a colossal fighter work in a platform fighter? What if there was a fighter with the height of two men, the weight of four, the strength of sixteen? The Iron Giant is one of the most absurd experiments in platform fighter history. A gargantuan robot who eats cars and hits like a truck, who is both an immovable force and an unstoppable object, a great big target that can be bullied for minutes at a time. 
but can also hit a button that negates his own knockback? A character who can slowly earn an overcharged, missile-spewing super transformation mode that might not even be stronger than his regular form? Iron Giant's strengths, weaknesses, and base stats are so extreme that Smash 4 Little Mac seems tame in comparison. And so far, this mad and magnificent experiment has been a little overtuned. There was a point in the beta where the Iron Giant had the best online results across every skill level. Luckily, the devs were well aware of this and adjusted the character patch by patch. I don't know if Iron Giant will remain as a deadly war machine, or if he'll ultimately be toned down to be a goofy, off-meta, low-tier oddity, but I do know that I have nothing but respect for the devs for including such an ambitious character design. Conclusion. Honestly, I could go on and on. Multiversus is not as polished as Smash, and clearly has a much smaller team, and licensing agreements are far more volatile at Warner, but the actual nuts and bolts game design is so confident and so experimental, and genuinely pushes the genre further while standing out on its own. Every character in this game showcases ambitious game design that goes far beyond surface level references and wants to get to the heart of who the characters are at a conceptual level without compromise. I didn't even talk about Morty, who feels as desperate and chaotic as the hyper-violent action scenes in his show, or Batman, who is overwhelmingly competent and ready for anything, but doesn't really kill. Or Black Adam from the hit movie Black Adam, starring Dwayne Varrock Johnson and available on streaming services now. Last year, I was able to use the launch of Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2 as an excuse to salvage an abandoned script I had about that game's predecessor. And yeah, the return of Multiversus is the same situation. I adored the game from the beta, but I wasn't able to make a video on it in time before interest fell off, so I'm glad I finally get to talk about it. Unlike my Nickelodeon video, this wasn't a moveset concept and there's just general analysis and criticism, which might be the direction of a channel going forward, but rest assured, I had a Wily e. Coyote moveset ready to go and it was really good, but in the interest of being as faithful as possible to the source material, I made sure to delete it so that it could never see the light of day. Oh yeah, by the way, as a bit of housekeeping, um, I ended my Nickelodeon video by eating chalk in a basement and begging for a free game code, so I figured for the sake of the lore of the channel, for all the Max Ham fans, I'd uh, give you all an update on that. We did it boys, we got the game! NASB's influencer manager gave me a code because I'm an influencer. I'm very influential, I'm big time now, great game, beat it like 50 times. So I'd like to thank Nickelodeon for the free game code. I'd like to dedicate this video to Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2. This video is sponsored by Nickelodeon. Can I get... It's not. Can I get sued for that? Bye! Subscribe! That's all, folks!